Okay, so now uh, we can start formally the, the first lecture. So our first lecture uh, will be by uh, Mauricio Richard from the Universidad Federal do ABC. Uh, Mauricio, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, ah, okay. Perhaps sure, you can uh, share your screen again. Yeah. Yes. Okay, please. So Mauricio will give a, a, a three lecture series on uh, uh, black hole perturbation theory. So it's gonna be an introduction. So the first talk is now, the second is tomorrow and the last one would be on Friday. Okay, please, uh, Mauricio. Thank you. Uh, so maybe, is... maybe Mauricio, before, before Mauricio starts, yes. let me just uh, make a quick comment. So we have a discussion session today in, uh, after oh, the yeah. second lecture. So uh, I invite everybody who has more detailed questions to Mauricio to participate because he will also be there to answer the questions. Yes. Thank you. Okay, very good. So, okay, so I'll, I'll start. Uh, I'll... So, so um, my slides are all in Portuguese, but I'll speak in English. And if anyone has any question, like as uh, Dimitri said, uh, you, you can make them in the in the session uh, later today. But if, if it's a quick question or like some something that you, you can uh, you can ask during the presentation, uh, I don't mind. I just can't see the chat, so if one, if one of the organizers can then make the questions, uh, tell me that there is a question, I, I appreciate. Um, so I'll, I'll just speak this in Portuguese quickly, so that everyone, to make sure everyone understands, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start. Então, uh, em português, uh, eu vou apresentar os slides, uh, eles estão em português, mas eu vou falar em inglês. Se alguém tiver alguma pergunta rápida, quiser né, fazer algum comentário, pode fazer né, durante a apresentação mesmo, não tem problema, pode fazer em português e depois eu, eu, eu respondo em inglês. E, e depois, né, no fim, do, perto da hora do almoço, acho que é 11 horas, né, 11 15 tem uma sessão de discussão e aí também vocês podem fazer mais perguntas lá. Ok, so uh, I'll start, so this is uh the first part of, of my my lectures um so uh, i'll give a, a brief outline of what i'm gonna talk and what what are the objectives uh that i have planned for you um, so so the main topics i'll be talking about are scattering quasi normal modes and quasi bound states um and uh, so, so the objective of the, cur the, the course is to introduce some basic ideas on, on black hole perturbation theory and to teach some of the numerical methods involved. Uh, and I hope that at the end of the course, the students will know what super radiance is, what quasi normal modes are, what are uh, quasi bound states of a black hole, and that they will be able to calculate them. So that the student will basically uh, know the, the, the fundamental uh, framework for black hole perturbation theory. Uh, the the re recommendation, so, so what I expect that the students know is some uh, notions of general relativity. Uh, let me know if I... Can, can you see the, the, curs the cursor, the mouse? Oh. Yeah, okay. Yep, yep. Okay. And uh, so, so some notions of general relativity, uh, basically uh, the Kerr and the Schwarzschild matrix, uh, some notions of known relativistic quantum mechanics, very basic things like uh, uh, one dimensional scattering and the hydrogen, hydrogen atom, and some, uh, also some basic notions of mathematical physics like uh, separation of variables, series solutions to differential equations, and the Frobenius method. Um, so, so I've organized the lectures in three parts. I'm not sure if we'll be able to 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 make the, the third part with, in, in much detail, but. Uh, the first part will be today, when maybe some a little bit on uh, tomorrow, where I'll, I'll 
speak about the basics of the, the scattering. Uh, I'll explain what the quasi-normal modes are, what are the quasi-bound states, what, what is super radiance, and what are the uh, how and when you can get instabilities in uh, around Schwarzschild and carry black holes. Uh, but there is no uh, numerics involved in this first part. This will basically be the theory. And uh, we'll use scalar fields, so this test fields, which reproduce most of the more uh, important and complicated features that you find by when you deal with actual uh, perturbations of the black holes, gravitational waves, for instance, electromagnetic and gravitational perturbations. So the, this test fields are basically re reproduce uh, several interesting properties and, and the, the mathematics is much simpler. So this will be the focus on this first part today. Um, then tomorrow I'll, I'll talk about the numerical methods, which uh, will be performed in this uh, test field framework, but they are, uh, they, they extend quite uh, directly to to the to the more interesting fields of uh, electromagnetic perturbations and gravitational perturbations. Mm -hmm. And then in the third part, I'll talk a little bit of about the, the actual gravitational perturbations and how you find uh, how you find them and what are the differences, how how you have to change the the test field framework to to work with them. Um, and, uh, but but as I said, in, uh, in we probably won't have much time to do this in much detail. So th this will be just a brief introduction to the the more complex and the the the, 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 the details. But I, I hope that by by knowing the numerical methods and the the, the test field framework, you the, the student then will be able to on his own, read about uh, the, 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 complete, the, the complete formalism and, and, and generalize the, the, the calculations and the, the, the methods. The, the references I've used for this lectures are basically these four uh, references here. So there, there are these lecture notes by Professor Emmanuel Liberti from uh, Johns Hopkins University. And I think there are also some uh, YouTube videos on, on this. So this is the, 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 the link where you can find these notes. Um, there's also some reviews on quasi-normal modes. So these two are the main ones I've used. The one by Verity, Cardozo, and Starinets, and the one by Konopla and Zidenko. Uh, and uh, finally, there's also a, 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 good, uh, a very complete review on uh, super radiance by Brito Cardoz and Pani, which I've also used, and you can find it in this last uh, link. Mm -hmm. So this part zero here, I'll just give you some basic notions and some notation uh, that I, 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 it's needed for, for the rest of the, the lectures. I have also some uh, uh, mathematical notebooks, which I'll share with you later. I'll, I'll send them to the organizer so that they can share it with you, uh, the, the lecture notes, uh, the, this presentation and this, these notebooks, which you can use later. And this, this definitions here are basically uh, uh, associated with the, the, the notation I use in these notebooks. So, I will use here units in which, in which the gravitational constant and the velocity of flight is, uh, are one. And we use the Einstein notations for the for, for the sums. And um, so given a metric, g mu nu, its inverse will be g mu nu if the index is up and the determinant is g. And uh, the convention I use for the signature of the metric is the mostly plus signature. Uh, these, these are basically the, 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 
the, the definitions of the Christoffel, the Riemann tensor, the Ricci tensor, the, scalar, the, the Ricci scalar, and the uh, Einstein's tensor, that they're not needed for what, we would, for what we'll do today and tomorrow, but on Friday, they, they will probably be important. And also in the, the notebooks, um, they, they are used in there. So uh, I just put this for, for completeness here. Uh, and here again, uh, just extending on the, uh, the, the basic uh, differential geometry on uh, the, that is needed for, for general relativity, the, the covariant derivative and uh, some important identities and this we use today. So the important thing here is, uh, the, the most important thing here is that uh, you can write this contraction of the, the Christoffel symbols in terms of uh, an ordinary derivative. And uh, by using this together with this other identity, which is the divergence of a scalar field, which also does not depend on. Um, so, so by using equation seven, you find equation, you, you can write equation eight, and you can also see that the right, right hand side does not depend on the on covariant, covariant derivatives. So it's just the, the ordinary derivative. And finally, by using this two, seven, and eight, you find equation nine, with it, which is the box operator. So the, the the, the Dalimbertian in, in a curved space time. And you can see here in the right hand side that it's also only written in terms of ordinary derivatives. So this makes uh, the, the calculation very straightforward for the, the box operator. And uh, so phi here is just a function, a scalar function. Uh, again, just to, to fix notation, the Schwarzschild metric is written here in the usual coordinates, equation 10, and the, the care metric is also in the usual boyer lindquist coordinates written here is equation 11. Uh, M, capital M, is the mass of the black hole. Um, small a is the specific angular momentum of the black hole. And you can see it's, it's written here, J is the angular momentum of the black hole. Uh, the important uh, thing here for us is that the, the event horizon for the, the Schwarzschild, of course, is at R equals to M. For, for, for the Kerr black hole, it's at this uh, coordinate here, M plus the square root of M squared minus A squared, which I define as R plus. And the angular velocity of the black hole is this capital omega here, which is basically A divided by 2m times the, the location of the horizon. And we, we will need this later when we talk about the uh, uh, scalar fields around carry black holes. Uh, also, this um, when you do calculations in Mathematica, uh, or other algebraic uh, manipulator. It's, uh, you can speed up the calculations if you, instead of using the uh, trigonometric functions, you, you define this, this new variable, chi, which is the cosine of theta. And the advantage is that then all metric components are not trigonometric uh, functions anymore. They are just rational functions. And you can see here what happens in care. And you, you get rid of all the cosines and sines, and then you get only polynomials and uh, ratios of polynomials. And then this, uh, uh, you, you avoid, you avoid uh, having to deal with trigonometric identities, and this can speed up things. So this, um, it, it, this is not needed for today or tomorrow, but in the, the notebook that, that I have prepared, I, I show there that the, the metrics solve the equations and you can, uh, and, and I use these coordinates there. So you need this if you want to understand what the, the notebooks that I will share with you later, uh, what I do in there. 
Okay, so now let's properly start talking about the, the scalar fields in Schwarzschild and in, in Kerr. I'll start with Schwarzschild since it's much simpler. Um, and, but, but before uh, starting with the with, with Schwarzschild, it's important to, to understand what we are, we are doing here. So we want to, to, to study black hole perturbations and the, the, the idea is that we have a solution of Einstein's equation and you want to perturb it and see how these perturbations behave. So we assume that these perturbations are small and so we, you can neglect higher uh, second order terms and like squares and, and cubes of the, the perturbation. Um, and basically you want to know how these perturbations behave, what equations they satisfy and so on. And if you do that, then uh, as people done uh, in, the, in the beginning, uh, j just after the, the Einstein's equations were, were proposed, you, you see that you can have uh, gravitational waves that propagate and so on. And, uh, so you, you can do this, this linearization procedure around Minkowski, for, for, for instance, or around um, a black hole uh, solution. And, and then you analyze what this, this metric perturbations do when there are a lot of ga gauge um, uh, freedom. And so you need to do a lot of gauge fixing to, to simplify your problem. And, and you can do this around uh, Schwarzschild black holes. And then this is basically the, the Reggie Wheeler formalism, what people usually, the, the, this is how people first did this or, uh, for, for Schwarzschild black holes. It, it's the, 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 the Reg Wheeler formalism they, by, by directly perturbing the metric components. Uh, you, you can do, but, but this doesn't work for, for Schwarzschild or at least no one has been able to do it because it gets really messy and complicated. So then there's some other formalisms like the, uh, and, and the, the one that mostly used is the, the, the Newman Penrose formalism. And, and then you can uh, study the perturbations around a, a curved black hole. But instead of doing this here in this first two lectures, uh, we can capture the basic ideas of this more complex formalisms by uh, study, studying scalar fields around a black hole. So the idea is that you have a solution of your equations, of your Einstein's equations, and uh, for, for instance, the, the Schwarzschild solution, and, and you have a scalar field, which is, uh, re represents a perturbation around this, uh, this space time. So, so you can think of the Einstein's equation together with this equ the equation for the field, which I'm going to talk about here now. And you can think that the, 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 the background solution is the, the black hole plus this perturbation. Um, sorry, the, the, the background solution is just the, the metric, the, the, the Schwarzschild solution, and the, the scalar field is originally zero. But you can assume that you make a small perturbation around this zero background field, and then you, you assume that your metric stays fixed, that it doesn't change, and then you can study what uh, to, to, to first order, what, what is the equation that the field will satisfy. And so the, this equation is the, the klein gordon equation. So the, this is the equation for a scalar field. It's just to, to understand how it arises. You can uh, start with basic special relativity, just the dispersion relation here, the, the relation between the energy and the, the momentum which is equation 14. And then you try to quantize this relation by using the basic uh, prescription in quantum mechanics, which is to, to transform the energy into an operator, which is I H bar del T, and to transform the momentum uh, quantity in, in the momentum operator, which is this operator, so basically the, the Naga operator. And by doing this, 
and assuming that you have uh, in special relativity, so just the, the Minkowski space time, then you get this equation here, which is equation 15. And here, M is the mass of your field, of your particle. So when you do this prescription, this prescription, so you, you, you're studying a scalar field, which is phi here, this little phi. And so mu here is just the mass of the scalar field divided by h bar. Uh, and then if you now do the, the usual prescription for going from uh, special relativity to general relativity, which is basically changing partial derivatives to covariant derivatives, then you arise at the this klein gordon equation for a uh, field in a curved space-time, which is basically uh, the, the box operator, which I showed you earlier. And here, using that identity that I showed you earlier, you get this expression for the scalar field. So by uh, knowing the metric, you can just plug the components in here and then calculate this ordinary derivatives and then you get the, the equation. And you can see there are two derivatives here. So of course, because it's the box operator, then you get the second order partial differential equation. Um, so let, let's start with Schwarzschild. I've shown you the, the metric before. And so I'm assuming everyone has some familiarity with it. Uh, and the, the idea here is to separate the equation. Um, this is just the basic procedure similar to what you do for the hydrogen atom when using when studying uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, I'll, I'll do here something a bit more general, which is what we, you do in, in the care uh, background, but it's basically the same thing that you do in quantum mechanics. So we separate the scalar field into the, the time and angular components and radio component. You can guess already that you can separate the time and the, the phi component by using the, the simple exponentials here because the, the metric is stationary. Uh, it doesn't depend explicitly on, on the time t and it's axis metric because it doesn't depend explicitly, explicitly on phi. And then what is left to do is to separate uh, the radio component and the other angular component theta, which uh, I'm using now instead of theta. Now I'm using chi, which is basically let me just go back a few slides. It's just cosine of theta. And um, uh, of course, here since Schwarzschild is also uh, it's not only axisymmetric but it's also spherically symmetric, you can already guess that here. This S function here will be the, the Legendre polynomials, and then you get together with this exponential of phi, you get the uh, spherical harmonics, and you could start with that already here. But in care, you don't have spherical symmetry, so this is what we need there. And just to make things a bit easier to generalize later, oh, oh, I, I, I prefer to do it this way. Uh, so this is done in this notebook that I'm talking talking to you, and uh, I'll I'll show you later in the end uh, the notebook, and then I'll I'll make it available for you. But the, the calculations are done in there. You can you basically just get this put these n sets in the klein gordon equation, which is here equation 16. You plug in the metric components for Schwarzschild, and then you find these two equations that the equations separate, and then you get an equation only for the, 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 the function R and another equation only for the function S here. And you, you notice that there's a new constant here called lambda, and this lambda is the separation constant when you do the, the separation process. Um, and then the first thing you need to do is to determine what lambda is. So, so what I'm doing here, as I said, is very similar. It's basically the same as you do in uh, the for the hydrogen atom, and most of you probably already know it. But I'll 
make it. Uh, it it's important to, to comment because it's, this is more complicated for the clear black hole, and it's uh, it's uh, it's important to make sure that everyone understands the details. So you need first to know what this length is, and the, the thing is that for this angular equation here. If you get an if you put an arbitrary lambda here, then the your solutions the, 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 you find two solutions. This is a second order uh, ordinary differential equation, so you get two independent solutions. And for an arbitrary lambda that you put in here, then these solutions will not be well behaved. They will uh, diverge at the poles of your sphere. So when uh, theta is zero or uh, pi. So when chi is minus one or plus one, so cosine of theta is cosine of zero or cosine of pi, so one or minus one. And then th this becomes an eigenvalue problem and you, you need to find which omega or which lambda will give you regular solutions. And then of course, in this case, this is just uh, the associated Legendre equation. And then you find that this lambda has to be has to have this form l l plus one where l is an integer then if you do that then the, the, the solutions become well behaved at the at the whole sphere and uh, and then you 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 can start worrying about the radio equation so uh, basically i'm just rewriting here and then of course th this is a linear equation, uh, the, the, the klein gordon equation is a linear equation, and then because of this, you can write your general solution as a sum of all these uh, mode solutions that you find by separating the variables. So you basically have a frequency omega, this L number, which indexes this um, separation constant lambda, and then you have also the m uh, azimuthal number, which comes from the separation of the phi variable. And so we have one mode solution, and then you can sum over mode solutions, and then you can find a more general solution of your problem. Um, but this doesn't give you a complete uh, picture of what's happening, because you also have the quasi-normal modes, which I'm going to talk a little bit later, uh, which you, you also find when you do a proper sketching problem, that they, they are also there. And also the quasi bound states may also be there if the field is massive. But anyway, this is just to remind you that you can, since the equation is linear, you can write uh, the full solution here, uh, except for this quasi normal modes as a sum of the uh, this individual in, individual modes. So let's now deal with the radio equation. So the, for the angular equation, we already know that the solution is the, the Legendre polynomials. And you know that the eigenvalues lambda are in the form integer times integer plus one. So the, the, radio, equa the, the radio equation becomes much simpler if you make some change of variables. So the idea is to, to transform this radial equation here, equation sorry, 17, into a Schrodinger-like equation. And the, 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 the goal, the, the, the motivation behind this is that then you can do some analogy with uh, basic one-dimensional tunneling problems in quantum mechanics, and then you can uh, it's easier to understand what's going on. So you can uh, rewrite the equation by doing this two change of variables here. So the first change of variables is changing the uh, this the radial function r by this radial function psi here, which is basically the radial r function times the radius r. And you also change the radius r to a new radius 
which is the famous tortoise coordinate r star according to this defined according to this relation and then you can integrate this relation and you can find the explicit expression for the tortoise coordinate and the the idea behind the tortoise coordinate is that you stretch your coordinates um, and you take the horizon which is located at r equals 2m to minus infinity in this new coordinates so you're basically stretching your domain from 2m infinity to minus infinity infinity and you can easily see this by plugging in here r equals when r goes to infinity you see that r star the tortoise coordinate is basically the same as r in this limit r going to infinity when r goes to 2m then you get this logarithm here and then you can see that r star goes to minus infinity because of the logarithm and if you do these two transformations, then this is also done in this notebook that I have prepared, then you find that you get this, um, uh, this Schrodinger-like equation. So you get, we have a, uh, accomplished here two, two interesting things. First one is that there's no first order term here for the derivative of psi. And the other one is that uh you have this here the 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 the, the zero ordered part is just omega squared which is the frequency squared minus a, a, an effective potential so uh, um, everyone who has studied at least a basic course in general relativity probably has seen something similar when studying geodesics around Schwarzschild. And here is very similar, but instead of studying geodesics, you're studying uh, the scalar field around the, the black hole. And then you get this similar behavior, uh, the, the similar equation. Um, and uh, so be before studying, like talking about the scattering modes and uh, Quasi normal modes and quasi bound states, and explaining them to you what they uh, explaining what they are to you. Uh, will, uh, it's important to, to look for solutions of this equation. So, there's no simple analytic solution for this, except in when you take some limits. So, if you analyze this equation near the horizon or far away for, from the horizon, then you can write simple solutions for this equation and this will have help us understand uh, better what is going on and how you you uh, can actually uh, make the analogy with one dimensional tunneling problems in quantum mechanics uh, so here is just the, the the full expression for the potential and i just want you to notice that here you still see this the original radial coordinate, but the derivatives are in terms of the new of the new tortoise coordinate. So there's an implicit, it's implicit here that you have to do the, the transformation of going from R to R star. But going from R to R star, to, to, to do this, to go from R to R star, you have to invert this equation here, 21 for R star. And then you, you can't do this analytically, and you can only do this numerically. Uh, I guess if you ask Mathematica to do this, it will give you an expression in terms of some uh, log, log product functions and so on, but it's, uh, it's better to do it numerically. Um, all right, so the asymptotic solutions. So given here the equation and the potential, we can then ask what happens when you're near the event horizon. So when you take the limit R going to 2M, and um, then as I said before, R star, the tortoise coordinate goes to minus infinity and uh, the potential, the effective potential goes to zero plus order one of uh, plus corrections, of course, and um, the equation becomes this simple equation here for the harmonic oscillator. And then you get just the 
cosine and sine usual solutions. And um, on the other hand, far away from the black hole, when uh, R goes to infinity, then you basically get that the tortoise coordinate behaves as the, the usual coordinate R, and the effective potential goes to mu, mu squared, so the mass term squared, and your equation becomes this one. Also, the, the, the basic harmonic oscillator equation with this modified, uh, with this different effective wavelength here. And then you can solve this easily, and then you get this exponential solutions here. E2 plus or minus i square root of omega squared minus mi squared times the tortoise coordinate. And you can put everything together and build uh, uh, solutions near and far away from the black hole. So, so near the black hole, if you uh, make a linear combination of the two solutions that you have found, then you get this uh, the, the, the first solution times the second uh, plus the second solution, and you do the same thing far away, the first solution plus the second solution. And um, here you can see that I defined k as the, the, the quantity square root of omega squared minus mi squared. Um, and one can ask, so now, now you can, we, we, we can uh, try to understand what this coefficients here, A1, this constants A1, A2, B1, and B2 represent. And um, I, I just remind you that um, this is a linear, uh, the differential equation is a, is a linear equation. So of course, uh, and then we have already used that can make linear combinations of solutions to get new solutions. So it's, this is what we have done here to find this asymptotic solutions far away and, and, and near the, horizon, the, the black hole horizon. And therefore, you can also take the solution and multiply by a constant, you get another solution. Um, and you can see here that A1, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this in the, in the next slide, but I'll change it now because it makes it easier to understand. So um, A1 so represents the amplitude of an ingoing wave near the, the black hole horizon. A2 represents the amplitude of the, an outgoing wave uh, near the horizon. B1 represents the amplitude of an ingoing wave far away. And B2 represents an, uh, the amplitude of an outgoing wave far away from the black hole. And here you can see the potential represented for L equal one and mu times M equals 0 0.1. And I've rescaled here the coordinates by M so that everything becomes uh, dimensionless once you introduce, of course, the G's and C's into the, the problem. Uh, and you can see here that this is basically a, a tunneling barrier. So we have just a simple quantum mechanics problem here of scattering. And um, uh, so, so that's how you can understand these coefficients, B1, B2, A1, and A2. They are just the amplitudes of waves that come and scatter off the black hole. And I remind you that the, the horizon here is at minus infinity. So it's far away here to minus infinity on your left on the left-hand side of this plot. Um, th there is a detail here, which is usually, uh, uh, people forget about this when they first analyze the problem, but it's important to, 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 to be alert about this. And this is the following fact. Let me go back a few slides just to highlight this. Here, I've written this as, exponential of minus i omega t, but I could have written it as plus omega i omega t if I wanted. And indeed, that's what some books do. They, they, they use here plus i omega t instead of minus i omega t. And if you do that, um, then basically your interpretation what, of what is ingoing and what is outgoing changes. And then you have to basically 
uh, invert this here. This would be the outgoing. This would be the ingo. Uh, sorry, the, the other way around. This would be the outgoing instead of the ingoing, and the plus i omega r star r star would be the ingoing instead of being the outgoing. But here in the, the convention I'm using, omega is always positive. We, we can do that without losing generality. Sorry. Uh, here. Omega is always positive, and uh, we decompose the, the temporal part using this minus i omega t. And um, there's another detail here, which is the following. And uh, if your frequency, recall that k is the square root of omega squared minus mu squared. So if omega is larger than mu, then you get the sines and cosines far away from the black hole. But on the other hand, if you have your mass term bigger than omega squared, then this becomes an imaginary number, k is an imaginary number, and these are not uh, propagating modes anymore. So they become uh, an exponential growth and an exponential decay, as we'll see in a bit. Um, so in a, in a scattering problem, if you want to do, if, if you want to make sure you have waves far away from the black hole, you need to have omega larger than mu. And then you can interpret B1 as the amplitude of the ingoing wave and B2 as the amplitude of the outgoing wave. On the other hand, if omega is smaller than mu, then you get this uh, exponential growing and this exponential decaying modes. And um, uh, Dimitri, yes. Yeah, just just uh, to remind, uh, what is mu? I, I missed this. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So mu is the mass term, and it comes. It shows up in the Klein-Gordon equation uh, when I did this uh, quantization procedure. Here, it's just the mass of the field divided by h bar. And okay. uh, you have to introduce c's and g's, of course, but if it's when c is and g are one, then you get just m over h bar. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, Paulo? Uh, you should unmute your microphone, microphone Paulo. I'm sorry. Uh, don't you have a resonance in the case where omega is less than mu? It depends on which square root sheet. Right. You are. Yes. So, so you, you can get these modes that grow up, and you can get these modes that uh, that decay, and uh, so you can get these bound states, which basically could live in, in your can, can live your, in your system and I'll talk about them later but, but yes. uh, unstable states I'm, I'm talking about uh, you, you can get unstable states but uh, not for uh, in, in the Schwarzschild case you, you could look for them of course in principle they would be there but they 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 they, they don't exist. And, uh, but but for for curved black holes they exist then then you then you can find the, the unstable states that grow up in time. So here I'm I'm assuming that omega and mu are real, right? So I'm thinking about scattering states just to get this picture of what's going on. And um, but when you if you introduce some extra boundary condition here at infinity. Then you can look for eigenvalues of your problem. And then you look for uh, complex frequencies omega, and then you can talk about quasi-normal modes or unstable modes or uh, uh, bound states and quasi-bound states. And then you can see that for pair black holes you can get some uh, unstable modes. Okay. Okay. Many thanks. You're welcome. Um, let me see. How how much time do we still have? More or less. Still a little bit more than fifteen minutes. Okay. Um, 
so the um, uh, okay so so let's go back here so first of all uh since this is a black hole you expect that nothing will at least classically nothing will escape from the black hole so it's natural to impose here the boundary condition that this amplitude a2 here is zero so that nothing no, no perturbation comes out of the black hole things can enter the black hole to this a1 term but nothing can e exit the black hole so uh, it's natural to impose the bad boundary con the condition here that this a2 is zero this coefficient a2 is zero and uh, there, there are also some mathematical reasons on why this A2 should be zero. And then you, you can do this by using coordinates that are, that are well behaved across the horizon. So this ingoing uh, 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 Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates. And in these coordinates, you can see that you have two solutions, one which is regular and the, one, the other one which is uh, diverges. And the one which diverges corresponds exactly to this solution, which is multiplied by A2 here, near the horizon. Uh, but fr from a physics point of view, it's much easier to understand this simply by, by noticing that nothing can ex escape the black hole. So, this is why we can uh, this is why we set a2 to zero so this is the, the the first boundary condition you impose and um yeah so a2 is zero which is what is written in here um and then you you can study two types of problems as i was saying before a scattering problem which is basically consists in Giving, so, so you give a frequency, a real frequency, and which satisfies omega bigger than mu, and then you choose the amplitude of the ingoing wave, and then you want to determine the amplitudes of the transmitted wave and of the reflected wave, uh, transmitted and reflected, the way around. Um, and, uh, but, uh, and, but you can also use, uh, uh, sorry, study other kinds of problems which are not scattering problems. So if, if you impose an extra boundary condition, so here, if you, for example, say that you don't want, you don't want the ingoing wave, so you just want the outgoing wave, then you have this extra boundary condition. And so you have a boundary condition on one side and another boundary condition on the other side. And then typically, not all frequencies will satisfy this problem. It's like a, a, a fixed, when you study perturbations on a, on a fixed string, a string with fixed ends, then you know that they have the normal modes. And this is basically analogous to what we are doing here when you impose an extra boundary condition at infinity. And then, so then not all, not all frequencies solve the problem and then you've, the problem becomes an eigenvalue problem and you need to determine which are the frequencies that that are compatible with your boundary conditions and this is typically harder to do than just doing the the scattering problem and so so by doing by by imposing this extra boundary condition then you can find this quasi normal modes and the quasi bound states which i'm showing you in a bit and um so, so here, be, before talking about the eigenvalue problems, let me first uh, show you the, the typical scattering problem. So here, the, the potential again for L equals one, mu times M equals 0 0.1. And you can see that there is at infinity, therefore, uh, that the potential doesn't go to zero, it goes to mu squared, which is 0 .00, uh, 0.01. And at minus infinity, it goes to zero. So near the horizon, uh, and so typically you have a, an ingoing wave with amplitude b one, and then it gets transmitted, and it gets reflected, and you want to determine basically 
the relation between these coefficients, a1, b1, and b2. The, since the problem is linear, you can divide everything by a1 or divide everything by b1 or by b2. And then in the end, you just need, it's physically, it's, it's only important to determine the ratios between these coefficients. <clears throat> and, uh, Okay, so th this is a, is a, I think, th this is a simple problem, right? You just have to, to integrate the equations using uh, this form here for the solution 25. And I'll, I'll talk about this tomorrow, how you do this uh, in more detail. You can do it, in, in, there are different ways to do this. Uh, but, once you do this, then you find that the relation between these coefficients, a1, b1, and b2. And, but, but even without doing the, the, the integration, you can find a relation between them. And you can do this in two ways. One, more mathematical, but it's simpler to, to, to do, is by analyzing the Rome scan of the solutions. So I guess everyone knows about this, and, uh, but I'll, I'll speak it quickly here. So if you have a, an equation, second order differential equation like this without the linear term, then you can define the Romskian between two solutions according to this expression here, 27. And uh, uh, the Romskian between two solutions will be constant if you don't have the linear term here, as it is in this case here of equation 26. So this means that the Romskian doesn't change. And if you calculate the Romskian between two solutions near the horizon and the Romskian at infinity, they should have the same value. Um, and you do this. Uh, uh, and since the equation is real here, if you assume that your frequency is real, the potential is also a real valued function. Uh, so you can take the complex conjugate of this equation and then you get another, if, if the original function is a solution, the complex conjugate is also a solution. So you plug this into here, equation 27, the solution and the complex conjugate, which is also a solution. You calculate this from scan, evaluate it at minus infinity and at plus infinity, and you equate them, and then you get this kind of relation here between the coefficients a1, b1, b2, the frequency omega, and this uh, wave number k which is the square root of omega squared minus mu, mu squared. And this is basically a, a reflection transmission coefficient uh, relation. The reflection plus transmission equals to one, where the reflection coefficient is the, this ratio between B2 and B1, and the transmission coefficient is the ratio between A1 divided by uh, A1 and B1. And there's this extra factor here, which depends on the frequency omega and the wave number K. Uh, so this is the mathematical way to see that this, this conservation of energy here holds. So the reflection and the transmission coefficient are, are always, that the sum of them is always one. Uh, so the reflection coefficient is just B2 divided by B1 squared, and the transmission coefficient is A1 divided by B1 times this, the ratio between omega and K. Um, the, the other way to see this is by uh, calculating, since this is the klein barton equation, you can calculate the energy momentum tensor associated with the, the klein garden field, and then you can calculate energy fluxes near the horizon, far away from the horizon, and then you see that the, the, this energy fluxes will be basically proportional to this uh, amplitude, say one, B1, and B2, uh, sorry, B1, B2, and A1. And then by dividing the energy fluxes, you get the reflection and the transmission coefficients. But this way, we don't need to deal with the, the, the Klein-Gordon uh, stress energy tensor. So it's simpler to do. Uh, so, so these are the scattering problems and tomorrow we'll see some solutions and understand it better. Uh, so, so the quasi-normal modes, so what are quasi-normal modes? So the quasi-normal modes are the, the characteristic oscillation modes of the system. 
and um, they, they arise when you introduce an extra boundary condition, as I said before, at infinity. So if you, at infinity, you, you don't have the ingoing way, you only have the outgoing way, then it's, your problem becomes an eigenvalue problem. You need to find what frequencies are compatible with this boundary condition. So this ingoing wave at the horizon and outgoing wave far away from the horizon. Uh, not all frequencies will be compatible with this. Uh, and in fact, only uh, usually the, these frequencies will be complex numbers. And uh, according to, to this scattering problem here that we just saw, if you don't have the ingoing wave, so B1 is zero, and then this transmission and reflection coefficients, they, they diverge. So you, you can understand the, the quasi-normal mode uh, solutions as poles, so frequencies that, that correspond to poles of the, the scattering coefficients. So you make an analytic continuation on the complex plane of the, the scattering coefficients, and then the points where these coefficients uh, diverge, so basically the, the poles of the, of the, the, the coefficients correspond to the quasi-normal modes. And in fact, there are techniques that are based on this um, to, to, to find it uh, on, on this, this uh, that, that use this complex function properties to, to, to determine the, the the, the complex frequencies, the, the quasi-normal modes. Uh, physically, you can understand quasi-normal modes as, as characteristic modes of the system since you don't have ingoing modes. So it, you can think of a perturbation that arises inside the system, and then you have outgoing modes far away going to infinity, and then modes going into the black hole. Um, and you can, and, and since there's, you're losing energy, your system waves are going out of the system and nothing is getting, is going in the system, into the system. It's natural also to, to think that your, uh, the, the, this, this modes should decay with time because you're losing energy. And, and this in fact is what the, the imaginary part of the frequency represents. Um, you can see here, if you write your frequency omega as a real part plus a complex part i omega e plus an Im imaginary part i omega e, and you do the same with your uh, wave number k, a real part plus an imaginary part, and then you plug this into the, 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 uh, the time and the, the radio parts of your equation. Here, it should be r star instead of x, or r instead of x. Sorry for the mistake, I'll go correct it later. Uh, and then, then you can see here that you have the, the, the real parts of omega and of k give you the propagating part of your solution. So just a wave with a, a phase velocity given by k over omega and the frequency omega r. But if you had this complex parts, then you also have this exponential temporal time uh, part and this exponential radio part. And they can grow or decay in time and they can grow or decay in space. Uh, and here we are only looking at i equals infinity, but the, 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 the temporal part will be there for uh, all, uh, we, we have this behavior everywhere, not only at infinity. So in this eigenvalue problem, you look for solutions omega that are complex functions, and you can find, in principle, negative or positive imaginary parts. If the omega, if the imaginary part of omega is negative, then you have something that decays in time, so that it, it's it means that you're losing energy as time goes by, and. This is typically the, the, the what you find in quasi-normal modes. So, so, so these are the quasi-normal modes. Quasi-normal modes are characterized by, by this uh, negative imaginary parts of the frequency. Uh, on the other hand, if you find omega, the, the imaginary part, that, that the imaginary part is positive, then you have a growing mode and 
it's an instability. So it's an unstable mode and not properly in quasi normal mode anymore. Um, and usually, typically, so th th these quasi normal modes, they are not normalizable in space. So that they're not localized in space. Or imaginary part of K will be uh, also negative, and then this will grow in space. And uh, so, so this tip, this quasi normal modes are not normalizable in this sense because they they uh, diverge in, in infinity. But if you do a scattering problem in time, as we will do probably tomorrow or maybe on Friday, uh, you see how they, 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 they arise for some time and then as time goes by, they, 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 they decay and then they, they, you, you can't see them anymore after some uh, sufficient time. Uh, Quasi-bound states, on the other hand, uh, they show up when at infinity, instead of having these propagating modes, you have uh, your mass term dominates, and this this exponential modes here become growing and decaying modes, and then the, the boundary condition instead of that, that you do for quasi-normal modes is no ingoing wave at infinity. For quasi-bound states at infinity, we impose that you have you don't have a growing solution in, in space; you only have a decaying solution in space at infinity. And you, you can understand when this is possible by looking at the, the, the potential, uh, uh, the defective potential. And you can see here, I'm, I'm just finishing two or three minutes. Um, you, you see that when the mass term is not zero, and here's really easy to see, you can find this uh, potential wells, your, your effective potential has a well somewhere in it. Uh, this is not true for all values of the, the mass, it usually depends if in a rotating black hole, for instance, if the mass is very large, then you don't get them and so on. But um, here as well, actually, if the mass is, is, is sufficient large, then you don't get this potential well. But for some values of mass, you can find them. And this means that you, you can find modes that are trapped in here in, in between this. Uh, for instance, uh, here I have a, I plotted the frequency 0 0.15. And you can see that you have this turning points here inside the, the potential well. So you can find modes that are trapped in here. But this, they, they are trapped, but they don't live forever because they decay in time. As the quasi normal mode has an imaginary part that is that the frequency is the imaginary part of the frequency is negative here the same thing happens so this 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 states are not actually bound states but they are quasi bound states because they decay in time uh, but, uh, so this is basically what it what is it is written here so we have this bound states when you find that the, the imaginary frequency is less than zero in principle, you could also find imaginary parts which are greater than zero, but then uh, this would be an unstable mode that grows in time. And to sum up here for, for Schwarzschild, when you do the, the, the scattering problem, you have a real frequency that you, it's, it's given a priori, and then you, and you don't put an extra boundary condition at infinity, and then you find your reflection and transmission coefficients. When you study quasi-normal modes and, and quasi-bound states, you have an extra boundary condition at infinity, and then you determine what the, the imaginary part of your frequency is. And you typically, the, the imaginary part will be negative in these cases. If you find an imaginary part that is positive, then you don't have, then you have an unstable mode, so it grows in time. And the, the, the important thing here is that for Schwarzschild black holes, you don't uh, find them. I, I mean, you, you can prove it mathematically that all the quasi normal modes have uh, the, 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 if you put this extra boundary condition at infinity, then all modes you find will have an imaginary part which is smaller than zero.
So the, the, this is the, there's a mathematical proof for this. Uh, for for curved black holes, on the other hand, you can find you can't find quasi-normal modes which are uh, correspond to instabilities, but you can find bound states which correspond to instabilities. And I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow. So I'll, I'll stop here because the next slides are about the curved black hole. Uh, it's just showing to to you how to generalize Schwarzschild analysis to curve. So I'll, I'll continue tomorrow. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you Mauricio. Uh, let's grant me in uh, for an applause for Mauricio.